Hello, everyone, and welcome to Punk Spider and iOS Station, making a mess all over the internet. I am Jason Hopper, and I'm the director of research at Complex, and I'm here with. I'm Alejandro Caceres. I'm the director of computer network exploitation at Complex. Years ago, Alex invented uh, or developed a system called Punk Spider, and I developed something called iOS Station. Um, they're both pretty cool tools and we, we've been dusting them off lately and starting to find some really good ways that we can work together. And uh, this talk is just kind of about how they started, you know, uh, how they're going and, and where they're gonna be soon. Yeah, so uh, start off with a little history lesson on what the fuck is a punk spider, right? Um, so punk spider was a distributed mass web application fuzzing project run over a Hadoop cluster and stored in a distributed backend. Don't worry if you didn't fully understand that. We'll be going through what the fuck that means uh, in, in a few later slides. Um, it was based on some older technology. Uh, you vaguely might remember it as that Shodan thing with some SQL injection or some other vulnerabilities about like websites or some shit. Uh, that's usually how people remember it. Um, so if, uh, if you remember something like that, that was Punk Spider. It was uh, presented at Shmoocon 2013 and uh, also at the slight so guest appearance at uh, DEF CON 2014 as well. So uh, still a long time ago during this uh, old release, everything was map reduced, right? Uh, if you remember that time of where big technology was the big buzzword instead of fucking like blockchain or whatever, um, then uh, you remember times of, of, of big data, right? And the real game changer there was that uh, we could now crunch data in a distributed manner that was not incredibly difficult, right? So MapReduce was not the most absolutely efficient way to do distributed computing, but it was absolutely one of the easiest and one of the most well-documented ones. Like you could follow simple tutorials and get a pretty decent cluster up and running. So it was actually really cool. Um, and everything back then was MapReduce. So now I'm gonna show you my sick UI skills coming up. Nobody get intimidated, you know? Um, this is the old punk spider. As you can see, there is a lot of, uh, you know, just text. But the uh, main thing I wanted to show you is you would type in a URL. You could also make that a, a kind of like wildcard URL, right? So like darknet.star, for example. Um, by the way, don't actually go to the site. It used to be a scam site, might have been taken down, whatever, just don't go. Um, and for those of you that already have, you know, sorry. But, uh, <laughs> What do you see, right? So you see that what's returned, which is at the bottom bit there, is a uh, last date scan. Of course, we want to keep our records updated. And a number of web application vulnerabilities that we're, that we're fuzzing and scanning for. Um, so obviously, this is, this is blind SQL injection, SQL injection, cross-site scripting, path reversal, blah, 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 other very serious vulnerabilities in websites, right? So. What we let people do is uh, in a very, um, in a, it's just an extremely open passion. We had an open API, open UI and everything is uh, you could search any websites that you wanted um, and get either aggregate statistics on um, the vulnerability state of, for example, if you were to do like star.edu um, or uh, just uh, kind of do your own research, do your own vulnerability research. Um, I believe by, you know, by the time this project sort of was shelved for a little bit, uh, we had something like 3.4 million vulnerabilities or something like that. So yeah. it was pretty cool. So now we're out with the old, right? That was old shit, old technology, um, great technology, good stuff that, that inspired a lot of the technology that's today, but it was still old, right? So now we're back, we're full on developing and the biggest change to the project is that Hyperion Gray was bought by a company called Complex. Uh, and Complex has been really amazing about giving us the time, resources, money, backing, legitimacy, everything possible uh, for us to succeed in this project. Uh, meaning that uh, really this thing is flying right now. Um, and, and I'll get into some of the numbers and we'll get into some of the specifics of what we're checking for in Punk Spider right now. Um, but this thing is really flying. It's got dedicated engineering time. It's not going back down, put it that way. And it's only going to get better and better. But uh, 
anyway, that's enough about Punk Spider. Uh, Hopper here is going to give you some uh, bit of backstory about IO Station. Yeah, so um, IO Station used to be called OmniSense. Uh, I apologize if I accidentally say that um, in, a, in a sentence later, but uh, sysadmins have similarly never liked this program or the system either. Um, it started pretty innocently, and sorry, what it is is just a giant collection of tools that generate and uh, aggregate data um, and, and make that available to a user. And it, it really did start out quite in innocently. I was just coming into the cybersecurity space, and I started learning about just how crazy the DNS, uh, DNS system is, uh, like what you can do with it, the way that it's uh, exploited. And it's such a seemingly simple system, but I couldn't believe the, like, the depth. Um, and I was, you know, learning about DNS amplification attacks and decided because the way that I learned things best is by recreating the wheel that I would just write a DNS server from scratch and I turned it into an amplification sinkhole and then started just getting really interested in that. So I was writing a blog post and I wanted to say there are, you know, this many open recursive DNS servers on the internet. A recursive DNS server, of course, being one that will uh, answer a query for any domain. It'll go out and, and find the answer up the tree. Um, and so I started, I couldn't find that answer, how many there were on the internet. So I started writing a little Python script to uh, do the scan uh, to find them. And then, you know, I realized that although that sounds simple and conceptually it's simple, there really is a lot of subtleties to actually being able to do even a simple scan uh, at scale. And, you know, and then, and then, and then it's some giant deep rabbit hole. And before I knew it, um, you know, I had this big system. Um, it's made up of many different parts, uh, but the, the primary parts are uh, port scanning. It's it's scanning um, over 25 ports. There's a lot of like custom, custom extractions that it's doing in addition to the obvious stuff like banner grabbing and service uh, detection and things like that. Um, on the dark web, we're again doing port scan scanning. We're trying to tease out any information on additional onion sites that might be hosted on the same VM or um, definitely any way that we can link it to a surface. IP address or domain or something like that to do any attribution for sites that you know should be taken down with from law enforcement. Um, we're also, of course, crawling all these websites as well. So we're doing um, you know dark web mentions uh, for um, you know corporate entities and, and names of other things of interest. And you know coming coming from the pure cybersecurity space, when we joined Complex, uh, Complex is a cybersecurity company, but they really focus in. Um, in assessing risk and transforming uh, risk. And so there's a bit of a mind shift that had to happen on my part where th some things that are really good for pure cybersecurity actually don't inform risk that well. And, and there are a lot of other tools that you can use in its place. So I've sort of been working on this system, but with that very much in mind. So a lot of the new kind of directions that I'm, uh, or the new tooling or the new things that I'm interested in really are kind of going down that namespace. And that could be simple things or, or seemingly simple things, like even just identifying what a corporation has, like what are their assets? Where are they? Some corporations honestly can't even answer that question for you. Um, and so uh, doing this in a kind of broad autonomous fashion is really interesting, um, how that informs other sort of risk metrics. And then looking at kind of proxy measures like, uh, what jobs are they hiring? What technologies do they have in those job ads? Like, how does that potentially inform, uh, you know, what they're doing in house? We also have some passive sensors. I'll, I'll call them. You know, we're we're monitoring the uh, global certificate transparency logs. So pretty well, any SSL certificate that's generated, we get uh, we record a copy of in in near real time. And then we also have another significant component, um, which is our listening network. So they're basically these low interaction honeypots that have distributed globally and all across the IPv4 spectrum. And they're out there, sort of just, you know, listening. Uh, they then can identify the early onset of any sort of broad malicious activity or benign activity, for that matter. Uh, and we can use that as a way to profile the threat in, like, a sock log, for example. You know, socks have a lot to deal with. They don't need to be chasing down leads that end up just being like Google crawlers or the university of, you know, whatever doing research. Um, Similarly, we can use this to inform a risk score by by looking at for any given corporation, if we know what their assets are, have any of them been involved in, say, being part of a botnet? And if so, for how long? Like, you know, getting popped, you know, uh, once last year is one thing, getting popped and then remaining part of a, uh, a botnet or whatever for six months is kind of something else that sort of speaks to their, their detection and remediation policies. Uh, of course, I still have the amplification attack sinkhole. It's not the most not the most particularly valuable sensor, but you know it's an oldie and a goodie. Uh, and then, you know, honestly, I started learning that if you uh, if you just start registering with places and then and, and looking under some rocks, there's some really good data that you can get for free. I mean, Aaron and who is um, sorry, Aaron and Iana, uh, you know, can provide lots of data. So I, I collect um, 
uh, who is data on IP addresses, which gives you ASN information, organization uh, details, and, and point of contacts. I do get domain who is, but that's such a low value signal, it's almost not worth mentioning. One of the ways that Alex and I are collaborating right now actually is on uh, doing some malware analysis that uh, we capture in our in our network. So that would be you know just doing fingerprints, looking for what sort of network behavior um, might be going on and trying to integrate that with some of the other tools to get a more broad picture of what's really going on in the internet. And then uh, I also record all information from the uh, DNS root zone files for, you know, like a thousand um, top level domains, basically anything that's not a country code. And that can be really interesting uh, just to identify suspicious domains as they pop up. They might be used as like a C2 server or um, phishing or something like that. But then it also can be used in actually identifying uh, assets of a company. Um, uh, the other thing I forgot to mention is, um, you know, in, in terms of prox proxy metrics for the corporations, you can also do things like look at their SEC filings and try to evaluate, you know, for a company of this size in this industry, is their funding and cybersecurity sufficient? Uh, and lastly, uh, you know, no cybersecurity tool is complete if you're not uh, pulling in some GOIP data. <laughs> Um, so this has been a big in undertaking for a lot of years. And so to, uh, I started off small, but I needed to rent some servers and things. And I, I figured I was more interested in spending money on something that I can hold in my hand and have forever or for a long time. So instead of buying a lot of cloud ser uh, services, I actually convinced my wife to allow me to build a small data center in the basement when we were redoing the basement anyway. And so the middle picture here is sort of the, uh, the the first version of that where I've got a whole bunch of old desktops and I bought a few used Dell R710s, which bang for your buck are, are awesome little machines. Um, they can really, uh, they're real little workhorses. Uh, and I had to become an internet service provider, which meant, you know, registering with the government and applying for a license. I've got a BITS license, which is basic internet uh, telecom service license, which means I can actually sell internet to my neighbors, which is funny, although, yeah, there's not really much good reason to do so. It's not exactly cost effective. Um, but I have used some cloud services, so I, I've done a lot of scanning for years using uh, Linode, and Linode's always been really, really supportive. Um, they, you know, have asked me to abide by a number of very reasonable guidelines, and uh, otherwise they they provide me a lot of uh, a lot of cover for the uh, very large number of abuse complaints that I uh, bring their way, which is really awesome. So, uh, you know, if by chance anyone from Linode is uh, is out there, or the trust and safety team in particular, who I feel like I'm on a first name basis with. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> and you know, one thing uh, I'd like to say about this is that I I, I had the uh, the lovely opportunity of of seeing this project from kind of beginning to end. Uh, not not like there. I don't live with Jason and his wife, <laughs> but um, I got to to uh, you know hear about like, hey, I'm thinking of building a data center. Um, all the way, you know, to that middle picture, which, by the way, just to point out, Jason is a woodworker, metal worker, astronomer, blah, blah, blah. He, he does fucking everything. Uh, and he's good at it, too. Um, so uh, he built his own little server rack right there. And you saw that once he surpassed that, he bought a big fucking server rack. So that's, that's just fucking Jason. He's crazy. It's anyway, true. I just wanted to point out how insane it is that, you know, he literally built an internet service provider in his basement. Um, and he's like, yeah, no big deal. Just um, a Saturday. So, anyway, that's all. No, it's true. I was quite proud of that little server rack. You know, I used pocket holes and everything, you know. Um, it was fun. But, uh, you know, Alex, we've been talking a big game here, man. What do you say we uh, put our websites where our mouth is? I don't know. That's a terrible joke. <laughs> sure. No, I like, I like it. Let's put our websites where our mouth is. Where... All right. So, <laughs> so... You know, a little preface on this one. So we do have a user interface that has been revamped since the one that Alex has shown. However, uh, it is not released yet. Uh, we are releasing a UI in the fall of this year. Um, this is just our sort of internal alpha use version only. Um, functionally, I'm sure it bears some semblance to what we will just, uh, end up releasing, but the one in the fall is gonna be much, much nicer than this even. Um, so, you know, this is Punk Spider. Um, no good search engine is complete without a giant search bar. So up at the top here, I'm gonna just, I'm just gonna pick like a random domain, something that, I don't know, may or may not be a little bit popular uh, and do a little search. And you can see that uh, this kind of tumblr.com website had no vulnerabilities, but you know, there actually is this one called uh, kickstarter.com, which just so happens to have, I see here, a cross-site scripting vulnerability. Um, so we display that, we show the parameter that we're using to abuse this, and then we've got these handy dandy buttons 
where, which you can click uh, to test the vulnerability, which will actually open up this web page with this payload and show you that uh, it actually is um, it is working. And then you can also copy a curl command, which is kind of handy if you want to you know change the text or do whatever. Um, we also have this like fairly complex way of scoring these websites. So our thinking is that any one of the vulnerabilities that we're testing for are just insane to have on a website in modern times. You know, there's no excuse for it, which means that if you have even one cross-site scripting vulnerability, your security posture basically is a giant dumpster fire. So we, I think very appropriately, rank these websites on the scale of one to five dumpster fires. Um, and that's what this, you can kind of see it is uh, here. Um, so another kind of cool thing is a way that we've already started to kind of work together between the two projects is port scan data. So, you know, this is kind of an easy lift, uh, all things considered, but you can click on ports and see that, you know, this one, for example, is running a, uh, looks like a mail server and an open SSH server. And, and so we're starting to kind of bring this data sets together and, and start answering some communal questions. Uh, but at the end of the day, what we want this to be is just a giant database that users can search. You can look at your own domains. You can check the domains that you visit or frequent. We want this to be a, a really awesome security tool for, for the masses. And there are a few limits that we've had to walk a fine line on. Um, of course, we don't want people coming here to just like rip off the database and go do whatever. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll kind of circle back to that. But uh, yeah, did you have anything to add, Alex? No, no, that was an excellent overview of, of our user interface. I mean, you'll see the little country codes, of course, which, uh, which, as Jason mentioned, are uh, essential to any security tool. Absolutely. <laughs> so, you know, Alex, it's funny. Early, before this uh, this talk, um, I was actually on this website called archive.org, which I know is really, really popular. And this new browser extension I've got has this like this eight on it, and it's it's trying to tell me something. Do you know anything about that? Uh, I don't. <laughs> you don't. Oh, I'm just kidding. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thanks for the lead, bud. Um, yeah. So. What we really wanted to do here is um, Punk Splatter has a few goals, and we're going to talk about them a little bit later. Um, but one really big goal that we have is that we want to engage not only with the security community. I know we're speaking at DEF CON, and you're probably with the security community. But I think it's really important that we release our stuff out there so that it's ingestible by normal humans, right? So if you look at the browser plugin, it's, uh, it's really simple. Uh, you may have already guessed this. There are several vulnerabilities on uh, archive.org. Uh, it has one dumpster fire rating, which I believe is, is appropriate for the number of vulnerabilities found and the types of vulnerabilities found. Uh, and probably the most important part of this plugin, frankly, is just that big red spider, right? So uh, that red button just tells you, hey, this website is dangerous. So anybody that knows something about web security, doesn't know anything about web security, et cetera, whatever, anybody can really use this. Um, one other really cool feature uh, of this plugin um, is the trip report. So at the very bottom right of, uh, of the plugin, you can see it says trip report. And if you click on that, uh, we've only gone to some sites with cross-site scripting right now. So you know the, the results are, are kind of obvious in terms of what they do. Uh, but all we're doing is we're taking basic types of extremely serious web application vulnerabilities and give you and giving you a rolled up kind of view into the last in my last browsing session. Um, how many websites did I visit that were vulnerable? Right. So that's something that you might want to know. You might want to say like, oh shit, okay, I, you know, I've been browsing for a week. Um, and I have like 1% vulnerable. I want to go back and see who that was and determine if I want to give them more information, right? Like extremely important for you to know that. Uh, so that's what we wanted to do with, with this browser uh, extension. It's also got this little like reset button that you can press that resets your stats. And um, one particularly important thing, uh, Jason, if you can just go to like any random website, I don't know, like Google is a pretty good one. Uh, and open up the extension for me. Yep. Uh, you can see that uh, it's grayed out, right? But it has a, that that means that Punk Spider doesn't currently have any data on it. Um, or is it, I'm sorry, Jason. Uh, yeah, I, I, went, I went I went to Google, so it's, it's been scanned. Green? Yeah, no, it's green, It's it's been scanned. Oh, fuck me, it's green, okay. So Google has been scanned, so it's gonna tell you if you're clean as well. Um, another state of, uh, of this particular plugin is gray, which means that we haven't scanned it. Um, if it is gray, then you have the option to submit it for a scan. 
this game is really, really, really fast. Like I've never seen it take more than like three or four minutes. So um, that's currently the plugin. Uh, I wanted to show that with a major website like archive.org because most of you have probably heard of it. Um, and uh, it's a very off use website, but we can move on to the next one. Yeah, so just to illustrate the, uh, the vulnerability here, I'll, I'll hit reset and you can see it executing the payload, printing out the message that we've, uh, we've programmed. Yeah, which is totally elite. Yeah, ah. totally elite. All right, cool. Let's move on to the next one. Lending tree. All right, go for All it. All right, so these fucking lending tree people. Okay, so lending tree, right? Um, what can I say about them? Okay, uh, I contacted them on Twitter about uh, what I described to them as a horrible vulnerability that is very obvious in your website. Um, and I did not receive an answer. Uh, I could give you a whole rant on my views on fucking responsible disclosure, but I'm gonna save it. Uh, and uh, just say that as you can obviously see from, from Jason loading the page, is that, you know, this payload is executed seven times. There's absolutely no filtering going on here. Um, and you can also see that it's, it's just it's just in a basic bitch, basic ass query parameter there, right? And that payload is not very complicated. That's like the cross-site scripting payload, basically, with like one thing added. Um, so there's really no excuse. Um, we contacted LendingTree. Um, let's see, uh, a journalist contacted LendingTree. Uh, I contacted, no, I didn't, yeah. So two people contacted LendingTree. This was over a month ago and we still have received absolutely no response. Um, that to me is, is just egregious. Um, we are not checking for really super complex second order blind SQL injection to get a fucking out of band shell. We're giving really basic bitch uh, uh, parameter injection here and, and just getting it right back. So any simple website scanner, whether it be open source, paid, whatever, should really be able to catch this. Hell, you should be able to catch this shit manually um, if you're building this website. So uh, it, it's really a, a kind of inexcusable one. And because it's a popular website, I felt like I'd go ahead and call them out. Also, well, yeah, I won't, I won't pick on them anymore. But yeah, that's all I have to say about lending tree it is funny too you know people complain about you know you get a um a pen test team that's not all that good and all they do is run automated tools and but they're cheap or whatever like when we're talking about cross-site scripting and a lot of these vulnerabilities like those would still expose these problems so these companies are not even doing that yeah yeah and i mean if you include even even including like time of uh of like an engineer like that's like it's like 10 minutes you know <laughs> like it's not a significant cost either like so Anyway, uh, moving okay. on. All right, we, uh, we got to move through the next ones, I think, a little bit faster here, but that's okay. This is a good one. All right, not a problem, bud. This is tapas.io. Um, it is a manga website, not about uh, delicious, delicious tapas, but that's okay, right? So um, as you might have guessed here, if, uh, if you click on the plugin or were to, were to uh, check Punk Spider or whatever, you can see that it's red. Um, it has a vulnerability in it. It's a cross-site scripting vulnerability. Um, I know that you didn't see an alert box pop up, but um, let's go through this website real quick, and uh, you know we'll uh, we'll see we'll see what it has to say, right? So pretty basic login page, username, and password, login, remember me, etc. Um, okay, that's fine, right? So Jason, if you could just scroll all the way down the page for me, sure. please. Oh, holy cow! There's like this whole other login form almost completely covered by the by the footer. What what's that? Yeah. So this is the real login form for the web page. Um, thanks for the lead in, bud. Um, but this is, the, uh, this is the real login page for, for the website, right? So what all I've done is, uh, because most cross-site scripting also has HTML injection uh, vulnerability in it, uh, we uh, just pushed it down with a bunch of BR tags, right? So like uh, um, line break tags. Um, I pushed the real login all the way down and created a fake login up at the top. So what does that allow me to do? That means that I can, grab that link that's in the in the little bar right there, send it to everybody that I know uses tapas.io, whether that be from a Twitter search, a LinkedIn search, a whatever search, um, and it's something that they inherently trust, right? Um, so now I can just sit back there, harvest usernames and passwords. I know there's still like some cross-origin restrictions that we need to uh, kind of get around. This isn't a web app hacking talk, so I won't 
I won't go through those, but uh, it, this is very easy to just start stealing usernames and passwords is my point. Um, and that sucks. So to anybody that says that reflective cross-site scripting is not that serious, you're wrong. This is why they're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so you know our, our tests aren't looking just for cross-site scripting, although there are many of those. Um, we're also doing um, SQL injection, as we've, as Alex has said before. Um, so this is an example of this. So primeinvestor.in, you know, presumably something to do with finances. They've got a login page. They might have pretty sensitive information behind this. And we were, uh, they're not sanitizing their inputs. So we were able to uh, have the web server execute an SQL query just by putting it into like a text form or something like that. Um, it's also kind of interesting that it can also, even the error can give you back more information. Like this is clearly a WordPress uh, site, but this is crazy. I mean, you know, a, 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 all they're doing is not sanitizing their input. I mean, most frameworks nowadays won't let you avoid it. I mean, this has got to be like, you almost have to go to your way to have this still be a problem. And, and it's a huge problem because this is being executed with the same permissions as the web server itself. And so the web server must have read write permissions on all the tables related to users and things like that. A website that has this kind of problem, it wouldn't surprise me in the bit, uh, in the slightest, if they had plain text passwords being stored in the database. So potentially they could just dump this whole thing. At very least, they're probably not salting them or whatever, and you could just, you know, unhash them or something. But um, this is a massive problem, um, really. I mean, this is, yeah. I think you, you have, do you have more to say on that, Alex? Uh, I, I do, you know, we think of sites like this, like, like primeinvestor.in um, as not, not a huge deal, right? I, I, I mean, whatever, you found some SQL injection, good job, right? Um, the problem with that is that we can no longer rely on that argument, right? So we are in the age of data breaches. Uh, we're to a point where uh, data, breaches, data breaches are so prevalent that, you know, you have tens of trillions of records sometimes in, uh, in leak aggregators, meaning that uh, every breach, whether it affects you directly or whether um, it's a website that you actually care, whether the, the username and password that you use on that website was uh, um, was sensitive or not, like it, it can still affect you, right? So, so websites that have nothing to do with you are now seriously affecting the security of, of corporations and people in general, right? So uh, like I said, we're in the age of the data breach um, and stuff like this is, is really inexcusable. Um, to, to give you an idea, all of the websites that we're showing are in Alexa's top 5,000. Like you may not have heard of, of some of these websites, but they are the top websites on the internet. So to have something like this is, is, um, is really just irresponsible, quite frankly. It, it's completely irresponsible and it's, uh, it's causing major problems across the internet these days. Like even the fucking colonial pipeline hack was a credential stuffing attack against their VPN, right? So, I mean, that can be completely unrelated websites got breached and then a VPN got breached. Like we can't have websites like this out there that are just giving usernames and passwords. And we also know now from, from all these aggregators that, 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 are, that are being built and, and all the password research that's going on that one, people are fucking terrible at passwords. Like, you know, we get secret five one, and that's all of a sudden a fucking secure password. Um, but the other thing um, is that uh, people reuse their passwords everywhere. So even if it's a site that you don't necessarily care about, if you reuse that password in one single place, uh, somebody could easily find it. And that's all I have to say about that. Yeah. Um, I think the next the next example is actually a pretty cool one. So this is a traversal attack, which means that we can put in the URL the path to a different file or something that the uh, that the web server should definitely not be allowed to access or, or certainly shouldn't be showing to a random um, website viewer. Um, but we're doing this with the passwords file in Linux. And what that does is it gives us a list of uh, all the different users and groups, inc including all the system users that this server has. And this is a massive problem because basically this means that we can view files on the server easily. So we could go through this list, find a username that we think is a person or like an actual user, and then try to, uh, for example, view their private key, uh, their SSH private key. If we had that, then we could also take a few guesses at maybe some, if it's on a VM or it's just you know hosting this website even, 
um, you know, maybe it's using some common frameworks uh, like WordPress or something. So WordPress has, a, you know, some default install folders. So maybe we can then go and try to look at the config file and get the database password. So now we could potentially log into the server and access the database freely or the database of another server being hosted on the same VM. I mean, it's this server is vulnerable, which means really it's putting all of its neighbors at risk. Um, and it's it's just again, it's just so silly, like, you know, fix the permissions. Yeah. Um, yeah. Lastly, this one is just sort of uh, a bit of, you know, beating a dead horse here, but um, Kickstarter has a cross-site scripting vulnerability. So I just hit refresh here, you know, punk spider back. <laughs> Nothing shows this off better, but Kickstarter is a, a big organization. They can afford, you know, and like one intern to just go through and check for obvious uh, scripting vulnerabilities and stuff like that. I mean, there's there's really no reason for this. You you give these, this company money, you, you have login credentials, you have user data i mean i don't even know what else they probably have on the back end but uh you know you're putting people at risk with this yeah cool so all right let's head back to the slides all right so you know how is this being used alex wonderful question jason so uh i feel like we're news anchors or something but <laughs> anyway <laughs> so you're probably wondering of course so we're releasing a fuck ton of vulnerabilities right and we're just giving them out for free. So how do you access them, right? A few ways you can use this. One uh, is the browser extension, which we've shown you. Um, of course, they're very, very useful. Uh, please please download that and, and use it if you like it. Uh, there's a free and open REST API. You can search by vulnerability, domain name, wildcards are all allowed. You have uh, even character wildcards and things like that. So uh, full wildcard search, there's no limitations there. Uh, there's a CLI tool that you can use as well, uh, built by uh, the wonderful Mr. Hopper over here. So uh, you can get stuff like that as well. Uh, soon to come, search engine interface, already in alpha. Jason already showed you some of that. You can search by vulnerability, domain name, wildcards again, all in play. We don't, uh, we don't limit any, any of that kind of stuff. Recon NG module, Tim Tomes, you know him, wonderful man, wonderful software. Uh, hate mail module, if you use that. Metasploit module, just because everything needs a Metasploit module. Um, and really anything that you all feel uh, that you would like to see um, with this data. Just shoot us ideas. Well, we can build it or you can submit something. It's an open source you know, thing, uh, whatever. Um, but let us know how we can support you to support, yeah. To help us help you. Let us know how to help you basically and we will help you out. So yeah. moving on from there. How do we do this, right? Uh, we get this question a, a good amount. How do you scan that many websites? You had to create your own scanner, you have your own fucking internet service provider, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the real answer is it, it's just a fuck ton of work and a lot of benchmarking, right? The, the original Punch Spider was built on, on old technology, so there's a bunch of benchmarking I had to do in terms of what's important. What's important here? Computing power, memory, uh, bandwidth, uh, I.O., all kinds of different things. So. There was all kinds of tests that we needed to run to make sure that everything was running like as smoothly and as quickly as possible. We had some creative engineering in there, right? So we've we've repurposed a lot of technology that's really built for, you know, search engine technology, uh, data analytics technology. All of that stuff is being used in the back end of Punk Spider. It's just we're completely repurposing it for the purposes of offensive security. Last thing that we did is we embraced the cloud, right? Ride the snake, meaning we're, we're addicted. We're all of a sudden addicted to heroin. Uh, I mean, AWS. Same where, thing. What's that? Same thing. Same thing. Yeah, very, very similar things to be addicted to. Uh, both can cost you thousands of dollars a month. Uh, AWS is probably more dangerous. But, uh, but we really embraced it. And, and we just realized like, you know, you know the, the world is kind of moving in, in that direction. And so we may as well take advantage of that, right? So uh, next slide, please, sir. All right, all I wanted to show you is that we do have metrics and monitoring on the back end of this system. Like I said, it is a very well-funded, well-engineered system at this point. Um, all I'm showing you here at the top left, you'll see the word ferret. There is our uh, custom built scanner. Um, and all I really wanted to show you here is that uh, there's a bunch of different scan nodes and each of those scan nodes is handling thousands of different websites. So this will get reshuffled, uh, reshuffled and things like that um, as 
more data either comes in or this cluster is scaled more, which it, to me, it looks like it needs to be scaled a little bit more. Um, but uh, it, it's, a, it's a good view into the fact that we are doing truly, truly mass distributed scanning. So we can move on to the next slide. Uh, yeah, so actually you can skip this slide. Okay. All right, thanks, Derek. Uh, so how does this work, right? I wanted to give you a basic architecture of, of Punk Spider. We have a Kafka queue. Kafka is a simple queuing system. So something comes in and something comes out to a system that's ingesting that, right? The reason that we, that we need a queuing system in order to do this is that we are submitting so many URLs that we need a piece of technology that is distributed and allows us to handle the level of data that we're talking about because we're submitting about uh, we're submitting something like uh, tens of billions of, uh, of domains, which means hundreds of billions, if not trillions, of, of actual web pages. So uh, queuing technology is really important here, and it's used very much with throughout Punk Spider. Next slide, please, sir. <laughs> the ferrets. Infinite ferrets. Right. So uh, because that Kafka queue, uh, again, distributed, just gives you a website, uh, we need something to then scan that website. As I mentioned, that, that application is called Ferret, right? So that's our web app fuzzer works really quickly, um, works in a distributed manner. That kind is Kubernetes auto scaling. Um, so we need a lot of ferrets to really um, be able to scan all of these websites and get all of the data that we want and then present that back to you, which is shown in the next slide. And you see that we index these results into two different things. One is RDS for stats and the other thing is cloud search to uh, obviously build the, the search engine front end for, for everybody. Um, so all of this is, is kind of a simplified view into the entire entire thing. This feeds back into the queuing system, actually. Um, in, in, uh, yeah, anyway, this feeds back, back into the queuing system um, and can even create more URLs for us to scan and things like that. So um, that's basically how it works on the back end. What I really wanted to point out is that everything's fucking distributed. Everything is distributed. That's why I have pictures of lots of ferrets, pictures of lots of Kafka's, pictures of lots of results, right? Everything is distributed. So we can scale, sky's the limit. Cool, and- And, and then yeah. we grab more shit from IO station, which Jason's gonna tell you about. Yeah, so, um, you know, running running a data center has been a lot of work. It's interesting. It's, it's one of those things where you have to uh, decide where you wanna put your time and effort. Um, I've built this system on Postgres, which is awesome. If the, there's a really specific reason, I'll use something else, but I use Postgres a lot. RabbitMQ I used uh, for, for years. However, I've got, I had an issue where it would just like disconnect consumers all the time. Um, so all the sensors would be passing messages to it and then the consumers would get disconnected. And then the queues would get so big that they would stop delivering messages, which makes no sense. And then even worse, they'd continue to get big and uh, eventually explode the node. So I, I eventually replaced it with Kafka, which you know, isn't isn't perfect, but I've I've definitely had much better results overall. And the rest of it is kind of bash and Python because I've been developing this myself to this point. And so kind of simplicity is key, you know, removing as much complexity as, as you can in, in a lot of ways um, will uh, make your life a little easier uh, when it's just a, you know, one person operation that is. So Alex showed his UI, so I thought I'd toss mine up here too. It's pretty simple. You know, you, you type in an IP address, search it. It shows on the map where the uh, where it's resolving. We've got GeoIP and who is data. And then for the port scan data, uh, it shows each port in, in a different card. And I think I mentioned before, you know, it's scanning over 25 ports. There's a lot of custom extractions that are going on uh, in this. And then of course the normal stuff like, um, you know, service identification and banners and stuff like that. And it's too much to show in one screenshot, but below is where all the listening service uh, data is. And then there's SSL certs and things like that. Um, this this website has never been public, nor probably will it ever be, but uh, you know, can't let someone share their old UI alone. It's, it's inappropriate. So just a really quick um, little case study, I guess, of something that uh, has been coming across IO Station. So there's this thing called the Mozzie botnet back in 2019. Uh, I started observing it. Um, it's it's known to other people. It's a really it's a really big botnet right now, and basically it's trying command injection in servers. So these are the two URLs that I see most of the time, and you can see one of them is next file equals netgear.cfg, and then it pulls 
we get pulls this thing from an IP and port, mozzie.m is the file name, and then it runs it. And then similarly, the, the other one does the same thing, but mozzie.a and it executes it slightly differently. But basically this looks, you know, like it's trying to do this on Netgear equipment at, at a minimum. And we know from Punk Spider that there are tons of uh, websites that are vulnerable to uh, injection like this. So, so I started digging a little bit deeper and uh, I used the listening, sorry, I, I used this data to identify where the attacks were coming from and where the malware was being hosted. And interestingly, they were they were always different IP addresses. Whatever whatever service, or sorry, whatever um, computer was saying go download and run this malware was never the same IP address as where it was being hosted. Uh, and they were mainly hosted in China, like predominantly, you know, definitely some in India. And of course, it's a botnet, so it's spread across the world. Uh, but there was a huge amount of it coming from from China, which was interesting because then when I looked at what's uh, what sensors the botnet was hitting mostly, it was really heavily hitting uh, India, Japan, um, Australia, and then to a slightly lesser degree, Canada and Germany. But there were no hits in China, which was kind of funny. And I'm not trying to suggest that this is some sort of like, you know, you know, clever um, state sponsored piece of malware or anything like that. I just I just thought it was funny that none of my Chinese servers actually saw any of this. And it almost looks like kind of a geopolitical map, you know, um, a little bit. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> China's suspiciously missing there. <laughs> um, you know, I did dig in to look at what, what devices were actually being part of this botnet, and it, it definitely looked uh, a lot of D-Link, Netgear, and Huawei gear. Um, I saw IP cameras, DVRs, there were some GPON devices, which uh, which was a little interesting. I didn't really see anything that indicated it was part of any sort of like corporate structure or anything, but the, the software being used are a lot of web servers, but they're all the like kind of small lightweight ones that you see being used in sort of embedded devices and things like that, like home routers. And I, I did notice that the... Um, uh, Light PD uh, version that I saw a lot of actually 1.4.39 had just a ton of CVEs and and many of them were just like blanket you know remote code execution vulnerabilities and stuff which was kind of cool. Um, so I did kind of poke around at a few of these, seeing like what they were showing, and I found this kind of cool example. Uh, this was just somebody part of the botnet. It it has an interface that looks a lot like uh, D-Link. Um, I didn't try to log in or anything like that. The links on the top made you log in, but I did dig around the JavaScript because uh, there really wasn't that much actually. And I saw that it was crafting these these links. Uh, so I went to a few of them directly, like uh, sysstatus.asp, for example. And uh, you know, I guess it doesn't always want you to log in. So if you go to them directly, the, the login page actually works, or sorry, is bypassed. And I was able to see all the internal DHB tables and and all the routing information and all that stuff. And you know, while this isn't some you know egregious vulnerability necessarily on its own right, it's just kind of illustrating like this is the kind of nonsense that is still all over the internet. Like I know security has been a hot topic. It's it's getting better, I think. I think anyway. Um, but there's still craziness like this where these this this person's router just like lets you log in and uh, yeah, that's kind of crazy to me. So, you know, um, we're kind of running out of time here, but I'm sure the burning question in everyone's mind is where is this all going? So where, where is it going, Alex? Right, so I just want to recap for everybody, right? So uh, a couple of quick things. Created a hugely scalable system for fuzzing a fuck ton of URLs. We found a bunch of vulnerabilities in major websites. We've even found zero days in uh, popular forum technology, right? So um, obviously the, the probably most important part of that is that we're releasing it out to you all, the public. Um, and uh, we want to keep these results updated while still continuing to go extremely broad. Our target is still the entire internet. It is, we're, we're not going to let down on that target. We're going, we're going to continue engineering until we've reached that target and we can keep the records reasonably updated to a certain degree, right? So um, how can you kind of help us, right? So I mentioned throwing us ideas obviously is, is really helpful. But download that extension, use that CLI tool, start calling out websites. Um, all of these things are, are you know, really helpful and not only to Punk Spider, but part of the mission of Punk Spider, really. Um, we built this for you all. So um, feel free to use it, basically, <laughs> is all. As far as IOStation is concerned, uh, you know, I, I think that continuing to, to transform my mindset from pure cybersecurity to evaluating risk uh, and, and risk scoring is really interesting. So I want to continue kind of going down that path. That's not to say that there won't still be the broad internet collection tools that I've been uh, working with and know and love, um, but it's just that some of the, the newer features that are coming out probably will be geared towards that, uh, especially when it comes to critical infrastructure and industrial control systems, which for anyone paying attention to the news lately, I'm sure knows has been a bit of a hot button topic when it comes to certain pipelines, which may not be named. Um, 
but uh, I think that's a really fascinating area and, and especially one that's, uh, you know, obviously increasing in, uh, importance. Um, I know there's a, there's a lot of utilities and things that have really ignored their cybersecurity posture and, uh, and they're starting to get bit by it. And um, anyways, that's, that's something I think we need to look at. And, and the other one is, is a little bit more vague, but really trying to identify attacker infrastructure. Like, are there things that we can be observing from the outside to, to identify um, what an attacker is using and how they're organizing, but, you know, maybe early or on the onset or, or whatever, as early as possible, obviously is better. Um, you know, are there, are there, uh, is there software that can be um, probed and identified running um, across the internet? Are there, you know, any sort of particular um, techniques or patterns or signatures or anything like that that we can extract? You know, this, this one is not as well thought out, obviously, it's just something that uh, I think we're pretty interested in tracking down uh, long term, but, but I think that about wraps it up for us. So yeah, if you want to shoot us an email or, or whatever, um, feel free. You can, you know, visit our office, but uh, Alex and I won't be there. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, thanks everybody for coming and, and, and listening to our talk. We really appreciate it. And, uh, you know, thank you all for, for taking the time to, to listen to us ramble on about this system and, and hope you really enjoyed it. Yeah. Thanks everyone. Take it easy. Bye-bye. Right. Peace everybody. Later.